With ReZero Season 3 on the horizon, many people can tell something pretty important from the trailer. Combat, and lots of it. Season 3 is going to be a very action-heavy season, and with it, a lot of references to the power system. If you haven't been paying close attention, or it's just sort of lost to time as it takes multiple years between ReZero Seasons, this will be the video for you. This will be the first in a series of videos diving into the intricacies of ReZero's extremely developed and sometimes convoluted power system. Though on the surface it may seem minimal, there is so much going on under the hood, and when you view the power system as a whole, it all begins to fall into place. This video will have minor spoilers for some of ReZero, though I will not talk about events of the future of the story, I might mention names and of course powers that don't show up for quite some time, so if that bothers you now, is your chance to dip out. For the beginning of the series, we will dive into the ground level of the power system, the baseline functions that allow everything to tick and operate. To start with ReZero's power system, you must start with life itself. Every single living being in the world of ReZero has essentially an essence known as Ode. This acts as some sort of life force, not necessarily increasing or decreasing over time, but every being is born with a differing amount of it in their body, the average amount given to someone fluctuating depending on the species of creature or the size of the vessel. For example, dwarves on average will have less Ode than a giant, as the size of their vessels is wildly different. The purpose of Ode, besides to be a life force, is to store mana, a resource we will get to in a bit. A secondary function of Ode is being able to use it in place of mana to cast magics. But since Ode serves as a life force, you are basically eating away at your very existence to do so. Casting with Ode should either not be done at all, or be a last ditch effort if your mana reserves are extremely low. Though it's often considered a life force, running out of Ode doesn't necessarily kill you, but instead renders you in a state referred to as, quote, no longer being yourself, end quote and after some time of having no Ode, you will become crippled. Ode has a very specific relationship with our next topic, Gates. Just like every living creature having Ode, all living creatures are also granted an organ exclusive to those in the ReZero world, the Gate. Something Subaru also received upon being transported. The function of this organ is to act as, well, a gateway between the atmosphere and the being's Ode. We mentioned earlier that Ode stores mana, well, Gates take in the mana for the Ode to store. Gates, just like any other organ in the body, can also have issues. Some gates can be partly open, and in fact, this is true for most people, meaning using magic is simply not feasible for the average person. People like Anastasia are born with a defective gate, seemingly being a hereditary trait, making it so she takes in zero mana from the atmosphere. The only way she can cast magic is purely by using her Ode. Just like real life, through negligence you can also damage or even destroy your organs. People like Subaru have overused their gate to the point that it has become broken, and in Subaru's case, he can still take in mana, but he can no longer expel it. Because of this, he can also have too much mana in his body and die of mana poisoning. Because his Ode cannot handle the amount of mana he accumulates. We've referenced mana a lot, so it's probably time to stop beating around the bush so we can just get into it. Mana exists. Seriously, it exists everywhere around the world, a thing that just lingers in the atmosphere like oxygen itself. It all drifts around initially in an elementally neutral state. Its origin is a place that some theorize to be the very heart of the world, Ode Laguna. As its name implies, Ode Laguna is the Ode of the world itself. It's a place mostly unreachable, but all mana eventually makes its way back to the heart of the world after its use, so that it can be purified and placed back into the world somewhere, essentially undergoing a recycling process. It doesn't just stop at mana, but Ode Laguna also recycles people's souls, but that's something we can get into much more detail on later. But for what we do know about Ode Laguna is that it in itself seems to be some sort of sentient being, and inside rests the Cradle, in which the souls of the dead traverse in the process of being recycled. The Sage seems to have some control over this Cradle. Oh, uh, this is the mana section? My bad. Uh, as mentioned prior, mana is taken in by the gates, which is then stored in the Ode for future spellcasting. This means that mana serves as the primary element of the power system, and is the reason why 90% of it functions. Each being is assigned an element of magic that they can utilize, and when that neutral mana enters a person's gate, it is assigned the element that they are familiar with. Some people, in very rare circumstances, are gifted with the ability for multiple affinities. Now, let's get into magic itself. This technically isn't magic, but for the sake of categorization and to make sure we get in this at the base level, uh, it'll go here. The flow method is something many, many people make use of. It's capable of increasing strength, speed, and durability as sort of a catch-all enhancer. Certain characters are better at enhancing certain capabilities, like Gaston being especially good at utilizing the flow method to boost his durability substantially. It's a technique that is more often than not activated unconsciously by the user in response to strong determination though demi-humans and exceptional fighters seem to have it activated to an extent at all times. It's what the name implies, it's the flow of mana inside of the user's body to enhance certain aspects. 
This will explain what seems to be superhuman feats from non-superhumans, because the flow method acts as an interesting little equalizer for physical power levels. This fighting spirit can also translate into an aura that can have physical effects on the people around the user. It's quite literally being able to tell someone is hashtag him merely by proximity. It can induce extreme fear, nausea, a burning sensation, or straight up just passing out. Reinhardt in particular has such a ghastly aura of malice that people around him can feel even when he's just doing nothing. Witches were known to have such powerful auras that they could, quote, make men scratch and tear at their necks, roll their eyes back into their heads, blow foam out of their mouths, convulse, choke on their tongues, and split their heads open with their own weapons, end quote. The flow method and the accompanying aura would be the primary use of magic for a majority of people. For the rest, it involves spellcasting, or being a standard magician. Of course, magician and spirit arts users alike can make use of the flow method, but being able to actually cast spells is less common. To cast a spell, the user will take the mana out of their ode and pass it through their gate into an initially formless shape. Casters will generally make use of incantations, saying the name of the spell out loud to help them visualize the spell they are casting in their mind, because visualization is key. Though incantations are not necessary, many people use them to help form the image of the spell they are casting. If you say the name of one spell, but think of another, you will cast the one you are thinking of. Very skilled magicians are capable of casting spells without saying anything. You can flat out just cast a spell, like casting Huma, or you can add a prefix to it, each ranking increasing the power, but also sometimes outright changing the effect. These prefixes are El, Ul, and Al, in order of power differential. There are also multiple elements of magic, and sometimes these can be combined to create unique spells of their own, but usually only by very, very experienced people. These elements are as follows. Fire magic, which isn't exclusively fire despite what's on the tin, but is mostly known as temperature manipulation, meaning it can be used for both fire and ice magic. Examples include Goa, which is shooting a fireball, Ulgoa, shooting a lot of fire bullets, and Algoa, shooting a massive fireball that decimates everything in its path. On the opposite side, we have Emilia's Ice Brand Arts, allowing her to conjure weapons made of ice that have quite a bit of durability on the fly. Water magic is essentially life and healing magic. If you have no regard for human life, you are incapable of actually utilizing healing magic. Uh, water and fire have a spell crossover known as Huma, its base form creating a barrier to block other attacks. El Huma causes the caster to shoot ice spears from their hands, Ul Huma creates a massive ice pillar from the ground, and Al Huma creates a sharp 10 meter long spear of ice. There is a healing spell, but it seems we are unaware of its name if it has one, and it's something people can cast with no incantation. Wind magic is pretty straightforward, it's wind magic. Examples include Fura, a spell that fires off a wind slash. El Fura increases the speed of Fura so much that it travels at maximum velocity, and it can no longer be physically countered. Ul Fura, which transforms the air around the user into blades of wind that all fly towards the target, and Al Fura is a devastating torrent of wind blades that are described as having the force of, quote, a gigantic dragon and the sharpness of a treasured sword, end quote. An example a lot of anime onlys are probably familiar with is One Below 100 Feld, this slash used by Krush alongside her divine protection. Uh, Julius is able to combine fire and wind magic to use Ulgora, a spell that produces a magical firestorm. Earth magic is also pretty straightforward, examples being Dona, which summons a wall of earth, Eldona, which causes spikes to burst out from the ground, however this was only used in the web novel so this could change, Uldona, which creates a dome of earth around the user, and Aldona, letting loose an immense explosion of earth. Earth magic can also be utilized to use duplication magic, something that can turn one thing into two. Not much is known beyond that though. Yin magic exists as the debuff school of magic, also what our protagonist has an affinity for. Our first example is Shamak, which has quite differing effects depending on the skill of the user, Subaru's basically only depriving the target of its senses, whereas a high-grade Shamak could rend space together and basically teleport. El Shamak, which was only used in the web novel so this could change, made a target unable to control their body while under the effect. Ul Shamak is similar to Shamak, however with Shamak you can tell if you are standing, uh, with, with Ul Shamak, you lose even that sensation. Al Shamak sends a target to a different dimension, uh, probably never to be seen again, like the Great Rabbit. Beatrice's door crossing also utilized Yin magic, so too does her Minya, a spell that creates purple stakes that can rip targets apart. El Minya does the same thing, but has even more stakes, whereas Ul Minya creates a purple ring that binds a target. When they are bound, a huge purple light appears above the target to destroy them. Maroc is another spell, allowing them to reduce the effects of gravity, and on the flip side, Vita does the opposite. EMM is Subaru's first custom spell with Betty, allowing them to interfere with time and space around them. They aren't able to move during it, but while it's activated, things cannot come in to interfere from outside the barrier, an extremely good defensive skill. 
EMT is their second custom-made ability. A field appears around them, negating the effects of mana inside of it. This, of course, will not prevent someone from just beating your ass regardless, but they won't be able to utilize mana whatsoever, and that'll be it for Yin Magic. Yeah, it's definitely the most developed in terms of the amount of spells it has. Yang Magic is the buff school of magic, the complete opposite of Yin, of course. Yin and Yang were both neglected by the magic system, with Yang Magic being seen as essentially useless in-universe. The efficacy of the spell's cast can differ greatly day by day, even from the same caster, and it was seen as a buff system that actually hindered people from demonstrating one's abilities, some people becoming too dependent on it. Julius made use of both Yin and Yang Magic to cast Nect, a spell that turned the interference of mana between people to share senses with one another. It can also be used to cast Restoration Magic, which can recover objects to their original state. Roswell makes use of Earth, Wind, and Yang Magic to be able to take flight. Uh, it also has an offensive use, Jewald, a spell that fires heat rays from the user's fingers, with LG Wald doing the same thing, but bringing down those same rays down in a claw-like motion. Algae Wald is the ultimate form of the spell, firing a heat ray so powerful that it will annihilate anything in its path, much like Algoa. There is also a subject that we have labeled Other Magic, whether it be because how it works is nebulous or that it doesn't fit under the elemental organization system employed by this video. The first one is a spell used by Echidna about 400 years ago called Al Shario. The spell seemingly calls the very stars from the sky, and how it works is completely unknown, but it causes unimaginable devastation. The second would be Roswell's Weather Changing Magic, which caused it to snow in the Sanctuary. This is likely an incredibly hard spell to cast, utilizing multiple different affinities. There is also the Recognition Obstruction spell that seems to be imbued in cloaks like Amelia's that doesn't allow them to be, well, recognized. Roswell had also developed multiple fold magic, allowing him to cast multiple spells at once. Uh, the insanity of this feat cannot be understated, especially if we go back to the concept of incantationless magic being extremely hard for non-high-level sorcerers and this requires visualizing multiple spells. The most he has been seen using is five-fold magic, or casting five spells at once, burning, slicing, and destroying a target, but the highest he has used in general is six-fold magic, casting six spells at the same time. Sacrament of the Immortal King is an ancient spell that was lost to history with only an incomplete version being passed down. This spell is quite literally capable of reviving the dead, however, it cannot traditionally bring their soul back from its path of recycling via Ode Laguna. Therefore, the revived body isn't truly themselves. We have seen water magic users utilize this spell, like Felix Argyle, but it's also usable via earth magic. A function of magic we don't really know much about at this time is spell rewriting, but absurdly talented magicians are able to rewrite the very composition of a spell through physical contact. If they touch a spell, whether it be mid-casting or by touching a projectile, the very spell can be changed, altering it entirely or even deconstructing it. Another ancient magic some people are capable of using is magic circles. Giant circles that can cast complex spells, which can be drawn on the earth itself or even on living beings. They can cast particular spells like an EX2, but they are, can also, strangely enough, sever connections, completely disabling people's divine protections, and also disabling the covenants with the dragon that protects Lagunica. Finally, Soul Transcription. This is a spell that originated from Echidna, the Witch of Greed, but Roswell took it in order to transcribe his soul over a vessel soul usually his children, because his version of the spell requires a blood relation unlike Echidna's. That about does it for most of our known spells, but there is also another way to utilize magic. Magic stones can allow anybody to utilize any type of magic because, well, you're not actually casting it. They are clumps of mana that have solidified into what seemed like stones. This mana, just like when it passes through your gate, can take on certain affinities as well. Fire magic stones, just like the spellcasting variety, manipulate temperature. Uh, we saw them used by Otto in an anime original inclusion against Garfield. Water magic stones produce water, from what I understand, not being capable of doing the healing aspect, though it's possible we just haven't seen that yet. Wind magic stones produce wind, nothing revolutionary there, while earth magic stones seem pretty flexible, being able to improve the strength of objects, act as fertilizer for crops, and other things. Whatever other things means, Tape. Yin and Yang magic stones do exist, though they are largely used in meteors, something we'll get into in just a second, acting as battery substitutes. Uh, these are somewhat useful clumps of mana that could be substitutes for mediocre casting, is what it seems like to me. Fire and Earth probably being the most useful if we're not including being used as batteries like Yin and Yang. Another medium for casting magic are meteors, or as you might know them, metea. Uh, this is an old term that has recently been found to be outdated, because these are supposed to be a reference to shooting stars or meteors. Um, these also allow people to utilize magic without the use of a gate. That's why this section is labeled magic mediums. Types of meteors include the conversation mirrors we saw in Arc 3, which can connect to other mirrors and can allow audio and visual communication across long distances. 
the Callers of Submission, which can limit people's power, including even Reinhardt, a tube-shaped meteor used by Lip Barriel that can amplify someone's magic, or something like akin to Staff, a white spear-like staff that can be supplied with mana to fire something to mow down anything in its path. This staff was apparently designed to pester the Divine Dragon Volcanica. I'm not going to get into every single meteor here because there are quite a few, um, but that's basically what they do. While your standard magician will cast spells themselves, and some people will use magic stones as a medium, there is another subsect of magic user known as a spirit arts user. They can make use of, big surprise, spirits. Uh, these are beings made entirely of mana. And we can circle back to Ode Laguna for a bit because it has another function due to the inclusion of spirits. Ode Laguna gives spirits their very life. And generally, spirits are pretty friendly, though of course, evil spirits can exist. Spirits, by virtue of being living beings, also have Ode, and if that Ode is attacked, they do risk death. Spirits are not always physically materialized, and must use the mana around themselves to appear and disappear. This is where anchors come in. An awfully under-discussed function of Rezio spirits. To materialize in the first place, they must have something to store their mana inside, or an anchor. And they must also return to this anchor to quote-unquote sleep. Because spirits, after a bit of time of being out, get tired and need to recharge on mana. This anchor is most commonly seen to be a stone or a crystal of some sort, like Puck's crystal that hangs as a necklace for Amelia. However, human beings can also be used as anchors in some cases. Chap was an anchor for one of the great spirits known as Melakura in the Bonds of Ice side story. The hierarchy of spirits is as follows. Lesser spirits, which are just floating little balls that can transmit emotion. Quasi spirits, which have developed a defined sense of self, though cannot understand words. Spirits, which have fully developed into their own with their own goals and ideals. And great spirits, which are unbelievably powerful and also take a lot of mana to materialize because of it. Thanks to Echidna, the Witch of Greed, there are also artificial spirits like Puck and Beatrice, which are also extremely powerful, but have an extremely high mana consumption rate, and are unable to draw mana in from the air around them. There are four great spirits that rank above the rest, being exceptionally powerful even amongst other great spirits to the point that, well, they got a special title. They would be Puck, otherwise known as the Beast of the End, the artificial spirit created by Echidna and contracted by Amelia, and then we have the Stone Muspel, a great spirit that once roamed Valachia before settling somewhere and the nation itself utilizing convicts as an anchor for the spirit's power. Then there is Zarestia, the Slasher, an ancient spirit that not much specifically is known about besides the fact that a light sphere seems to serve as her anchor. Finally, the sacred beast Odeglass, otherwise known as the Benevolent Mother of Gusteco. The spirit had formed a contract with someone she would label the Holy King or the leader of the nation, a tradition that has continued into the present day. The aforementioned Melakura was once included in these four great spirits before being killed by Amelia and Puck's combined efforts in Frozen Bond, thus allowing Puck to take his position. Spirit Arts users are just another type of magic user, forming contracts with varying levels of spirits who do the casting using mana in the air around them. Like both Amelia and Subaru, though, because Subaru's contracted spirit is Beatrice, an artificial spirit, she must take mana from him every day to build up a reserve. Average Spirit Arts users effectively have infinite mana, not being limited by the mana pool in their ode, only purely being limited in power by the actual spirits they are contracted with and how powerful the spells they can cast are. The final category we'll be discussing today are Curses, a form of magical abilities that are made purely to harm people, an attempt to rip off the evil potential of witch factors, a topic we will jump into next video. These arts likely originate from Kosteko, and in order to be used require physical contact between the caster and the target. When a curse is activated, it can no longer be prevented or reverted. The only way to survive a curse is to get to it before activation. Our first curse that you might be familiar with is the Oath Curse Mark. Uh, this is a curse that binds the soul, forcing a recipient to keep the word they swore with an oath. If that oath is broken, the victim is engulfed in purifying flame, scorching the body and tainting their soul, never allowing it to return to Ode Laguna. The second will be Cursed Dolls, not really communicated by the anime, but an example of this is Elsa. This curse is a power that bestows powerful regeneration abilities to a target and allows them to be resurrected from death, passed down in Kosteko. To activate this, a Curse Arts user must carve a curse mark that includes the information of the target they want to kill onto someone else. Upon activation, the person with the curse mark gains immortality until the target's death. This normally comes at the cost of a cursed doll losing their sense of self and then becoming unable to do anything besides want to kill that target. And when that target is killed, the cursed doll too will perish. Someone named Holoseo was able to make unique cursed dolls, which is what Elsa was, that both had a sense of self and no specific target. His goal was to have one of his dolls kill the others to achieve a complete state, like how Envy absorbed the other witches. What this entails is unknown. 
Next, we have the Curse of Thorns, a curse that was placed upon the young Emperor of Valachia, Ugird Valachia, at birth. This causes the victim great pain, though luckily for Ugird, he was born without the ability to feel pain. More importantly, however, anybody who approaches the person with the Curse of Thorns will develop pain around their heart, leading to Ugird's isolation throughout his life. Similarly, a binding of thorns exists as well, created by Ugard Valachia, a curse that drags the lost soul of his victim back without being purified by Ode Laguna, effectively reincarnating them repeatedly. The Wolgarm curse is one we saw in Season 1 from the dog-looking witch beasts. When they bite someone, they cast the curse, and when it is activated, the functions of the target's body become weaker, and their mana gets drained and absorbed by the Wolgarm until the target's death. There are also two kinds of dragon's blood, one apparently having all-powerful restorative capabilities, and another being the curse of the dragon's blood. It is seemingly uniquely wielded by the Sin Archbishop of Lus Capella, contained inside of her blood itself. The effects of this curse differ from person to person, one person being bedridden by it, whereas another one only felt pain from its inclusion into their body, and also reported it speaking to him. Subaru was able to take on some of the curse from someone previously. If this is a feature of the curse, or another unique feature of Subaru's, is unclear. There also exists the curses of Halibel, the admirer, the strongest person in the nation of Kaaragi. By fusing a piece of his own fur or nail that he has cursed into his weapons, he can cast a curse that, no matter what, will kill his opponent. Similar to meteors, or magic stones, there also is a curse medium, basically. Uh, these are cursed tools that originate from the Valakian Empire. Our first is the Geninhive Orb Curse. This is an orb that exists on the gladiator island of Geninhive, a place where prisoners go to fight for the nation's entertainment. The main thing keeping prisoners there besides the deep, murky waters infested with witch beasts is this curse. Created by Groovy Gumlet, one of the Nine Divine Generals, this orb carves a curse mark into the inhabitants of the island. If one attempts to escape, the curse can be activated, killing the victim. Coming from the Sin Archbishop of Pride many, many years ago, we had also witnessed the Limb Rotting Curse, cast by the Scarlet Little Finger. This curse exhausts the gate of its victims, rotting the limbs of its target, until it eventually leads to the victim's death. If the Scarlet Finger is destroyed, the curse will end. Similarly, they also use the Will Abiding Curse, a curse that binds the soul of the target to the will of the curse's caster, turning them into a puppet. A pale blue carved seal is seen on the victim as the caster manipulates the target's body against their will, being able to manipulate it in ways the target would have never done to bring out their maximum potential, harming their body and in some cases even killing them. Just like the others, if the cursed tool is destroyed, the curse ends. Finally, they also utilize the Asphyxiation Curse. This curse activates when the target touches a loved one. A dark red bruise is left on the cursed one's upper torso area, which would begin to strangle the victim. This curse also seemingly drains the emotions from its victim, causing them to respond with less emotion as time progresses, possibly having them fade away completely. The same stipulation applies to this cursed tool as the others, and if it's broken, it ends. Though I may not have included every single spell or curse or what have you, uh, I got pretty close, these are the baseline functions of the Rezio power system. From a person's ode, to their gate, to the mana in the atmosphere, to the ode of the world itself, and to magicians, to magic mediums, to spirits and their users, and finally, curses. I hope this gives you an idea of just how intricate the Rezio power system can be, and we're not done yet. Next video, we will be touching on authorities, divine protections, and the man himself. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the funny YouTube algorithm. You can also become a YouTube member, which gives you access to your behind-the-scenes content, a badge on comments and livestream chats, as well as the use of emotes and videos before their actual release. You can also check the description for socials like Twitter, where I'm objectively correct all the time, and Discord, where we talk about ReZero, My Hero Academia, Jujutsu Kaisen, and stuff like that. That's about it, though. Thank you for watching. See ya.